Hello, and thank you for joining us for another Tuesday afternoon program here with the Genealogy Center. We're glad that you're here, and we're looking forward to today's program, which will focus on our Gale databases that we have on site here and how they can benefit your genealogy research. So our speaker today is Hannah Radebush, and Hannah is a domestic learning training consultant at Gale, a Cengage company, and she um, develops and delivers trainings for K-12 and public library customers. And she is a former language arts teacher with a decade of classroom experience, and she's passionate about creating content that is engaging and relevant. So I will um, go ahead and hand it over to her and we'll get started. Hello, everyone, and happy Tuesday. I'm thrilled to see such a good turnout for today's webinar. I'm going to go ahead and get my screen shared here. So like uh, Kate said, my name is Hannah Radebush, and I am your training consultant here from Gale today. We're going to be exploring your Gale databases that you have available to you through your genealogy center at the Allen County Public Library. So we're going to look at a few different things today. We're going to start with one of your archive um, resources called Slavery and Anti-Slavery, a Transnational Archive. It's a really big collection containing a lot of different resources divided into four different parts. So we're going to take a deep dive into that and I'll show you, <clears throat> excuse me, the different tools and features that you have available in that archive. Then we're going to dive into a few of your different archives unbound um, collections. You actually have three different archives unbound made available to you, and we will poke around in each three of them, um, time permitting. And then lastly, at the end, we'll have some time uh, for some questions and to review some support site information. But the first question really is when to use Gale for genealogy research. If you're familiar with the Gale databases at all, you're probably like, hmm, you know, how am I going to use this in my genealogical research? And the answer to that is historical context, mostly. Um, most of what we're going to be looking at today is a lot of primary sources to give you some historical context into your genealogical research. However, there are a couple instances where you may be able to view these um, resources in a more targeted and specific way. Mostly they're going to be used to provide some historical context. And we know that that includes all of the different elements that permeate the lives of every living person. Um, from political, social, cultural, and economic factors, we're going to be taking a look at the local histories of where these people were born, the events that may have shaped their lives, as well as the living conditions that they lived through to give us really a, a more well-rounded and extensive look into um, our ancestry. So the first archive that we're going to be looking at is called Slavery and Anti-Slavery, a Transnational Archive. And like I mentioned, it is divided into four different parts. So I wanted to take a look at each of those four parts before we jump into the resource. And before we do that, I wanted to review some of the sources that our information is sourced from. So we pull our information from over 40 different 46 different learning institutions, um, but these are just a few to highlight them. So we have partnered with these institutions and they've really contributed to the archival collections. And we have developed these in a way that um, will kind of mimic those microfilm collections and research skills of, you know, going to the library and pulling these resources, but doing so in a digital format. So like I said, these are just a few of the places that we get um, our information from. But I, of course, like to highlight those institutions. So like I said, anti-slavery and slavery is divided into four different categories. The first one being debates over slavery and abolition. So the resources in this collection are going to span from the 16th century to 1888. So these are going to discuss the abolitionist movement and the conflicts that existed within that movement, the arguments in favor of the institution of slavery, debates about colonization, and the forced resettlement of the formerly enslaved. So in this collection, it's comprised of over 7,000 different books and pamphlets, more than 80 different newspaper and periodical titles, 18 major manuscript collections, and over 370 different U.S. Supreme Court records and briefs. So this collection alone totals over 1.5 million different documents that you can go into and explore. So you're going to see that this is a really huge collection when you combine all four of these parts. 
Um, part two is entitled Slave Trade in the Atlantic World, and this is going to um, span from 1490 to 1896. And this is going to um, really discover the slave trade as a key global phenomenon. And we're going to look at um, documents that illustrate the slave trade across the world, but most specifically in Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, North America, and Europe. And just like in part one, this collection is comprised of monographs and individual, pa individual papers from company records, newspapers, a variety of different government documents. And part two um, consists of over 1.1 million different pages. So again, now we're over 2 million different um, resources just within these two parts of the archive. Um, now we're on to part three, the institution of slavery spanning from 1490 to 1888. Um, and this is the, the one that I find personally um, the most interesting area to research. And this is the experience of slavery for both the enslaved and the enslaver. We have a lot of primary source documents really sharing what this um, what this institution was like for the enslaved. So we're looking at this from a legal, political, and administrative perspective, um, really what helps sustain that solution throughout this time pe period. Um, and again, this um, consists of over 1.2 million different pages, um, legal documents, plantation records, personal accounts, um, newspapers, and government documents in this section. And last but certainly not least, we have part four, the age of emancipation, ranging from 1788 to 1896. And this section really focuses on the emancipation of the formerly enslaved in the different countries, um, activities of the US government in dealing with the formerly enslaved, and um, a lot of different documents from organizations such as the Freedmen's Bureau and different religious groups. So over, um, I have this here, um, you know, a lot of different documents. Again, we have um, correspondence, speeches, plays, financial papers, scrapbooks, telegrams, legal documents, diaries, journals, spanning from in 1788 with Lord Dunmore's offer of emancipation and ending in 1896 with Plessy versus Ferguson. So really a vast section of this archive. So all of our all of these four different parts are comprised of 71 different collections, really um, areas where we pull all of this information from. And there were a few that I wanted to highlight before we get into the resource, just some that I really thought um, spoke to the genealogical aspect of your research. The first one of those collections, and probably one of my favorites, and we're going to take a look at that in my um, demonstration, is Slave Narratives from the Federal Writers Project. So this happened in the 1930s as a part of the Works Progress Administration, um, and writers went out into 17 different states to conduct interviews with the formerly enslaved. So in this, pro in this process, they collected over 2,000 different narratives from the formerly enslaved, and um, these are just so moving to read. Um, we're gonna look at one from Indiana specifically today, but I think this would be really useful in your genealogy, providing that historical context. Um, the next collection is The Slave Trade from 1858 to 1892. Um, and these are, are comprised of correspondence and reports regarding the slave trade from uh, the British slave trade commissioners and naval officers. So the this collection includes name of slave ships, um, the list of captain and crews, detailed details of the slave ship seizures, and um, descriptions of enslaved conditions in countries worldwide. So this one really provides some context in just um, the suffering that happened um, during that time period and in those unfortunate situations. Next up, we have records of the U.S. Um, Circuit Court of the District of Columbia relating to slaves. Um, so these consist of emancipation papers, manumission papers, and affidavits of freedom, and some fugitive slave case papers as well. You can see here, and we're going to be looking at um, a lot of different resources in our walkthrough, but a lot of these are really scanned in written documents. Um, so you'll be able to, you know, just like that, that microfilm, adapting that to the digital research world. Um, you're going to be viewing a lot of resources um, that look like this, which can be um, a little bit difficult to read and decipher, but that's what makes the research all the more fun, right? 
Um, next, we have the U.S. Customs Service records from the Port of New Orleans. So this is one of the largest trade market ports um, in the world, and specifically in the southwestern United States during the 19th century. So this is where many of the um, enslaved were shipped to the United uh, to the U.S. Um, so here you can really view um, the nature and extent of the traffic of this region, um, read about some of the different conditions, and view the lists, the ship manifests of who were transported on what ship. We'll be taking a look at that today as well. Um, Last but not least, we have records of the Bureau of Refugees, um, the Freedmen and Abandoned Land Field Offices. So these include a lot of labor contracts, hospital records, and records relating to riots, murders, and outrages during that reconstruction period, um, most specifically in the South. Okay, so let's explore. We're gonna spend most of our time today actually in the databases. We'll hop back in here in PowerPoint in a little bit before we go into Archives Unbound. But we are gonna start here in Slavery and Anti-Slavery, a Transnational Archive. And you can access this through your library website in the Genealogy Center under On-Site Databases. And I'll share this PowerPoint with Kate afterwards so that you all can view um, those lists of highlighted collections and things if you're interested. Once you log into the resource, this is the landing page, kind of our home base that you are going to be logged into. If you've used any Gale resources in the past, um, this should look and feel familiar to you. Most of our resources are on a very similar platform. The first thing I like to point out are these sign-in options here in the top right-hand corner. Best practice is to go ahead and sign in as soon as you access the resource, but I do like to point out that we don't save any, any user data here at Gale, so we're not collecting any data from you. This is just a one-way communication, so if you find a resource that you really enjoy, you can save that directly to your, um, your Microsoft OneDrive or your Google Drive, and it will create a folder in that resource called Gale Primary Sources, and it will save it directly in there for you to access um, at your leisure, really. So you can save as many resources as you want, and we don't save any of your data. Um, we also have a UI translation. So if you have um, English language learners that want to use this scaffold, you can go in here. I'm gonna use Spanish as an example. And you'll see it has translated the user interface of my website, the navigation bars and such, into Spanish. So if you're an ELL patron and you want to use um, that feature, that accessibility feature, that is right there for you. So really for the bulk of today's walkthrough, I want to show you the many different ways that you can explore our content. And there are several different ways based on your research preferences and you know what kind of resources that you're looking at. But I can't stress enough that these, these databases, these archives are really here to provide that historical context. And as such, your research is going to be you know, guided by what you're looking for and what you want to un uncover about your ancestry in particular. So everyone's research journey here is going to look a little bit different um, depending on what lens you're coming at this from. So I wanna show you several different ways that we can kind of navigate this portal and uncover all of the really valuable information that is housed here. So I want to start by pointing out our learning center. Because I'm with you for an hour today, um, and I've sat through many hour-long trainings in my in my time through as an educator and as a trainer. And I know that sometimes when you go back to do your own research, those things that you were taught are a little bit fuzzy. So lucky for you, we have a learning center, which can be accessed here in this kind of floating toolbar at the top of your screen, as well as down here in the bottom. Um, so we are going to. Um, I'm sorry, not at the bottom here under about this resource. You can choose to read more about this resource or access the Learning Center. So I'm gonna go into the Learning Center and show you that first. So remember that you can always come back here after our training is over today and be kind of walked through some of the tips and tricks that can be found um, in this archive. 
So under conceptualize, we start with giving you some background information about the archive and what is included. A lot of this I covered in the PowerPoint presentation, but it gives you a brief overview of the different parts, the release date, and a note from the editor. We have some sample topics and searches. Searching in an archive can be a little tricky because there are so many scanned in handwritten documents and charts and tables and maps. It's hard to kind of assign a search term with that. Um, so the searching can be a little tricky. So there are some sample topics and searches if you're looking, you know, this gives an example of three different search topics under that umbrella of slavery and anti-slavery. So here for Slave Rebellion, for example, some more novice and advanced questions. So after we're done today, you can go here and look up some, you know, sample tips and searches to kind of guide you on your individual research path. We also have a content advisory. Because we are looking at content that is a product of their time period. And in this instance, an incredibly unfortunate time period, um, there may be something, there may be some content that is upsetting, such as outmoded language, cartoons, characters, and other imagery. So we do have a disclaimer here, just pointing out that this is a product of the time period and considering the subject of slavery and anti-slavery, there may be some things um, which are offensive. So just be, you know, know, just know about that and be warned of it before kind of beginning your journey here in the archive. There's a find section, which will give you some tips on searching, using different language and terminology, general search tips, for example. Tips for reading and tips for citation and copyright or reuse. So again, this can be found under on the main page and you can go back to the main page by clicking on the Gale Primary Sources at any time. It can be found under the Learning Center or here under Read More About This Resource. So I encourage you to explore that on your own, especially if you get hung up in your research and you're having trouble kind of finding what you're looking for, that Learning Center is a great place to check out. Okay, so we are now going to start looking at the numerous ways to discover our content here. There are lots of different ways and I want to be sure that you see all of them today. So we are going to start by exploring our collections. Now you can see right here, we have four different archives. These are divided into four different sections and you can select and deselect these as you deem fit. Today, I'm gonna to be cross-searching across all four of these for our demonstration, but if you are looking for content just specifically under um, the age of emancipation, for example, if you just keep that archive selected, it will just do a search of documents within that section of the archive. So just be warned that if you have all of these selected, it will be cross-searching across all four of these. And again, a lot of this comes down to personal preference and that lens that you're searching through. But I'm gonna be selecting all today and we're gonna jump into these collections. Now the um, collections that I highlighted, the seven collections I highlighted in the PowerPoint, this is where you're going to find those. But like I said, there are 71 different collections here that I'm sure each of you can find, you know, a different way to use in your genealogical research. You can see here there's a wide range from different papers and collections and pamphlets, letters and diaries, a really, really vast amount of collections here that can be searched. But one that I wanted to start with is the slave narratives from the Federal Writers Project. I mentioned this in our collection highlights, and this is probably one of my favorite ones. And I think it could be used in your research um, to provide that historical context. So I wanna jump in here first. Now, once I'm in one of these collections, you'll see I have a few collection facts over here, an overview. It will show what sub collection is included and I can choose to read more about this project. In this case, I'm looking at the slave narratives from the Federal Writers Project. So I have my overview. 
I have the option to search within this collection or view all of the documents in this collection. Now, like I said, searching doesn't always work um, as well as you might think because these are all, you know, scanned in. We're, we're again, again, we're mimicking that microfilm research experience, and it's really hard to just type in a search term and pull from all of that. So my favorite way to search in this is really to use some different filters and explore on my own. So I'm gonna jump into view all documents in this collection. So this collection consists of interviews with the formerly enslaved across 17 different states. So you can see here we have Arkansas, this is volume two, Texas, Virginia, North Carolina. We're gonna jump into Indiana. So you'll see here, this would be um, a document that would be more easily searchable because this is a scanned in kind of a, a book, really, a scanned in manuscript here um, that can be scrolled through. I'm gonna go ahead on to page three. So like I said, this is a collection of um, the formerly enslaved in their narratives. So here we have the informants that participated in the project a list of them here. And I kind of wanted to show you what the um, OCR looks like. You'll see over here on the explore section, right now I'm viewing a document image, but I can also choose to view the plain text. And this is not always perfect because these are scanned in documents. So a disclaimer that this may not always work um, the way that you would hope especially when there's a lot of formatting on the page or on the screen, but you'll see it takes what is here and makes this, you know, clickable and highlightable, and I can copy and paste and all of that good stuff. So as I scan through the pages, you'll see that this changes. And here, because this is a list that's formatted with different names and whatnot, um, it has the page numbers, you'll notice that the OCR has kind of a difficult time um, translating that. But as we go on into the text, for example, here we're actually into a, a narrative story, and this is easier to read. So not always perfect, but I do like to point that out. And I'll point it out a couple of different times throughout our demonstration. It has what the confidence level is here about how well it is translated. But if you're having trouble kind of reading these documents, um, that is a good place to check out. So I'm gonna go back to that informants list and show you as well all of these notes over here on the side. So you can see they're listed personal account. Some of them include the names here. Two ex-slaves from Emory Turner from Beaufort, Indiana. Rosa Barber from Delaware County. So if I click on view item, it will take me directly to that page. Now, once you're um, actually in a document here, you have several different tools to kind of adjust the view of your document. So you can zoom in and zoom out up here with the magnifying glasses. This is especially useful um, when we start viewing, you know, really large scanned in newspaper pages, um, which I'll, sh I'll show you an example of. But these, um, these zoom in and zoom out tools especially when it's you know, a handwritten document or something that's scanned in really small. Um, these will come in incredibly handy. You can choose to make the document fit across your screen, horizontally or vertically. You can rotate the document because these are scanned in. Sometimes you may have images of maps or something like that that will help to rotate it. You can click on the photo and adjust the contrast and the brightness if you need to, which again can be useful in some of those scanned in handwritten documents to make it a little bit easier to read. You can also invert the collar, which some people find useful, and you can reset. 
You can also choose to view this document in full screen. So you can really flip through the pages more like a book. And again, these would really provide context just to, you know, what it was like for the formerly enslaved, how they remember their, their time um, and their experiences under the institution of slavery. This is, you know, some really good firsthand account of that time period. I wanted to view one more collection and to do that, I'm gonna jump back. I'm gonna click on Gale Primary Sources to get back to the main page. I'm gonna go back into collections. And I wanted to show you the ship manifest from the Port of New Orleans that I mentioned. So again, to access that collection, I click on it. I have my overview here, some collection facts on the side. And again, I'm gonna jump into view all documents. So you'll see this is giving me um, this, the slave manifest records, um, both inward and outward. So if you had a particular time period or year or month that you were looking at, um, you can access these, these records. Let's start here on this first one, for example. Now, this is what I talked about. Some of these are scanned in and handwritten documents that are a little bit more difficult to read. So um, this may be a time to make this full screen, to really use those Zoom tools to make out the different handwritings. See here we have the residents, the shippers or owners, the class, um, height and stature, gender, age, and name. And you can scroll through these. This is 90 pages, just this one alone from this month. So lots of different records here under the ship manifests. And again, they have the notes over here. So you can jump ahead and view different item, items as you need to. Okay, so that is a way to browse by collection. And again, by doing that, I just clicked on this collection item here. But I also want to show you how to browse by publication. So you can see here, this doesn't include a list of monographs, but we do have 165 um, results here for different journals and newspapers and pamphlets. And over to the right-hand side, you, you can, of course, scroll down through all 165 different titles and show more results that way or you can apply the limiters that we have over here on the right-hand side. To expand the menu, just click on the plus sign. We have um, the county or territory, um, the publication state or province, the publication city, the language, et cetera. And we are going to filter here by state and look at Indiana. And we have one resource here, the protectionist. Now I'm gonna show you two different examples under publication title. Here we only have um, one um, date range. So we only have publications from 1841 from this collection, uh, but I'll show you one that has um, several different date ranges. But you can select here and you can scroll down through the different issues. So we are going to go into the protectionist and we're gonna go here. Um, I think it was this one I was looking at earlier. So you'll see we have a scanned in document here. We have um, the plain text OCR that you can view. And you can scroll through this issue from Indiana. Now, another tool that we have built in here is the search within this article tool. Now, if there was a certain search term that I was looking for within this issue of the protectionist, I can also do within this issue or within this publication, for example, I'm going to type in the term insurrection. So if I was looking 
for you know references to insurrection within um, this publication. I can perform a search. And you'll see two different searches come up within the protectionist. So I can open this here and you'll see that this um, this article content is talking about um, insurrection. And it's highlighted as it is mentioned throughout. Now, when you do a search, it will show you search term hits and the page that they exist on below so you can jump ahead. This is kind of like um, control F if you use it in a document, but it's searching this entire scanned in. Now, again, this is not perfect because these are scanned in resources, but you can view these search term hits and jump ahead. So if you're looking for a search term, if you're looking for a name, um, a name of a county, a name of a city, a name of a person, um, when we jump into some of these different resources, you may be looking for the name of a battle or a camp or a prison or something like that. Um, this is a great way to use the search tool and kind of jump ahead to what you're looking for um, within that resource. So I want to show you one more publication, one that has a few more options, really. So we're going to go back to this publications icon. And we're going to go to the state of Ohio. So you'll see here we have six different results for the state of Ohio. There was just one for Indiana. And we're going to go into the Cleveland Daily Herald because we have, as you can see here on the date drop down menu, coverage from a wide variety of years from the Cleveland Daily Herald. So we are going to jump into, let's say I want to look at content from 1858 specifically, and I want to jump into the December 18th issue. So this is where I said those, um, the, the magnifying glass will really come in handy because these are such tiny, tiny, it's such tiny, tiny text here. But you can zoom in and out of the issue and really read along. So if I wanted to, let's see, explore here a little bit. You can see the table of contents, things that are being mentioned on each page, because these are such huge pages. There's a lot of content on each page. So when you're viewing a publication like this, oftentimes it's organized in this manner. So if I wanted to read about, for example, slavery in Nebraska, I could jump ahead to where that was on my section. zoom in as needed, and find the section that I'm looking for. Now let's say I'm here on slavery in Nebraska. Let's say that this is something that I really found useful and I wanted to save this. Um, I wanted to be able to refer back to this later. You are able to send any document that you find in these archives that you find useful and want to be able to reference later. You can save them in a variety of different ways. We have a built-in citation tool. It defaults to MLA, but we also have APA, Chicago, and Harvard. And you can export these citations to a variety of different resources as well. So you can save the citation. You can send to, which will send it to your Google Drive or your OneDrive. And like I said, it will create a folder there where it will house this content. You can also send it via email. Enter the email address, the subject, and type your message. You can download this as a PDF or as an OCR, but again, these aren't perfect, so I don't really recommend that. I would do a PDF. You can also print. I love to point out the Git link tool. When you are in a Gale database, you never want to copy and paste the link from the top um, because as we add more content, which is all the time, um, these links may change and there's nothing more frustrating than trying to open up a broken link. So you always want to use this get link tool because it creates a persistent URL. So whatever page you are on at that time, for example, right now I am zoomed into this slavery in Nebraska section of the Cleveland Daily Herald from 1858. Um, if I use the get link tool, when a person opens this, they will be taken directly to this page. 
Now they'll be able to view it if they aren't a member of the library, but if they try to explore outside of this document, then they're going to be directed to sign in with their library information. So Get Link Tools is a crowd favorite. I highly recommend you use that when doing your research. Okay, just a couple more things I want to show you in this database that you've probably been wondering about. Um, number one being the advanced search. This is typically the way, um, or the basic and advanced search. This is typically the way that um, people explore content in databases. Because this is archival information, the search does work a little bit differently. Um, so this isn't as thorough as a search bar may be in other databases, but it is still useful nonetheless. So I wanted to show you what that looks like if I did a search, for example, of um, Fort Wayne, Indiana. You'll see that I am given some results here. I have monographs, manuscripts, newspapers, and periodical results that have come back. Now, a good way to use um, this basic and advanced search is to really incorporate these filtering tools that we have over here on the right-hand side. So you can filter by the archive. Remember, this one is divided into four different sections. So you can pull from whichever section you like. You can filter by subject. The source library, where we got that content from. So if you just wanted to view information from the Library of Congress, for example, you could filter it this way. You can filter by document type. So if you wanted to view um, letters or advertisements, for example. Publication date, you could pick a date range or before or after. Languages, author, person, or search within. I really like the search within tool. So if I wanted to search for the pages that, you know, maybe Fort Wayne was mentioned on, for example, you'll see here that filter has been applied. To remove it, I could just simply click on the X. But then if I applied that filter and said, okay, now I just want to view um, items from the Library of Congress. Then I can filter my results that way. So sometimes when you do a basic search, you may see it's pulling in this huge amount of information that is really too unruly to sort through. So I highly recommend these, um, these search filters to kind of narrow those, narrow the scope, the scope of that search. And you can remove those just by clicking the X. So I mentioned that using these Gale databases is mostly going to provide historical context for your research. Um, this is one way that I can find it being a little bit more targeted, um, specifically to your ancestry. Um, and this is by using the advanced search. And remember, there are those advanced search kind of tips and tricks in the Learning Center. If you um, need some help, you know, kind of narrowing your result, results or, you know, better targeting your search terms. But one of the things that I love to point out is this document type. So there are lots of different document types housed in these archives. You know, everything from newspapers, um, wills, weather reports, um, public notices, plays, photographs, all kinds of different document types for you to search through. And one of those is uh, um, obituaries, or, and there's also death notices as well. So this is something that may be able to help you in a more targeted kind of genealogical aspect, selecting those document types and searching. This is also a great time to use these filters as well. So you'll see here um, obituaries and death notices are pulled up here and highlighted on the section that they're appearing, but this has pulled over 6,600 results. So a great time to use these filters. You can filter by the publication city. So if you were looking you know, for something specifically from Augusta, Georgia, for example, you could limit it here. But this is in no way a comprehensive search of like all newspapers or anything like that. This is just um, from the publications that are in you know, these collections that we house here at Gale. So again, not a perfect kind of targeted way to do your genealogical research, but definitely something um, to look at if you're looking for something specific during this time period. You may find some awesome results. And if you do, please share them with me because 
I love nothing more than to hear that a training was successful. So please let me know if um, you use this and you find some real nuggets of information that you just found super interesting. I would love to hear that. Okay, two more ways that you can search, and then I promise we're going to Archives Unbound. Um, you can use the Topic Finder and Term Frequency. So under the Topic Finder, if you are, you know, looking for something um, not very specific and you want to drill down and narrow that topic a little bit, you can do that under Topic Finder. For example, if I was interested in something revolving around Nat Turner's rebellion, for example, I could do a search for Nat Turner. And I'm going to get this kind of visual representation of the topics that are covered here in this archive. So you'll see slavery is, of course, mentioned the most. And then there are these kind of subcategories below. So if I wanted to go to slave and then slave insurrections, for example, you'll see here it's giving me eight different results within this archive revolving around slave insurrections and Nat Turner. So you can type in any search term that you're interested in here and narrow it down kind of more visually than using the other filtering options. Another tool that we have is term frequency. So this scans the words that are mentioned in these documents and um, you know, really kind of charts how frequently those terms are mentioned and when. So if I ran with that same theme and did a search here for the term insurrection, and I have my year, my year ranges here scanning all content types, I could do a search here and it will show me how many documents are in this archive during these date ranges that mention insurrection. So you can see here, most commonly brought up in the year 1861, we have 668 different top topics. I'm here discussing insurrection. Then you can apply your filters. You can jump into the topic finder from here. So lots of different ways to explore the content here in these um, primary source collections. That just scratches the surface to kind of guide you on your research. But I do quickly want to jump into these other archive collections that you have through Archives Unbound. So you have three different archives unbound collections. We just viewed your primary source, um, slavery and anti-slavery, but you have some other options too. Um, three different archive collections, uh, evangelism in Africa. This is correspondence of the Board of Foreign Missions, um, the Civil War in Words and Deeds, and the War of 1812 Diplomacy on the High Seas. So these are your three collections. Evangelism in Africa, again, is the records from the Board of Foreign Missions of the Presbyterian Church, um, where they are traveling to developing nations and trying to spread the gospel during the 19th century. So this is a group that really established churches and educational facilities, hospitals, orphanages, and cemeteries. And this is all of the ingoing um, correspondence and the outgoing correspondence. So these include like diary accounts, um, sermon manuscripts, receipts of sale, field accounts, really focuses on their mission work um, in these different countries. You can see Liberia, Corsica, Spanish Guinea, Gabon, Ogoe, and Cameroon. Um, and it's really talking about um, the things that they witnessed there during their um, their stay in these countries spreading the gospel. So we have, you know, they describe the indigenous people and their cultures, the tribal factionalism in these countries, um, cultural difference, and the mores that they experienced. So some really interesting correspondence, a lot to filter through in this archive. But again, this, this just houses correspondence of the Board of Foreign Missions. Um, that slavery and anti-slavery database is really huge and it has, you know, millions and millions of documents. These are much tighter in focus, so they're much smaller ar archives with a much tighter scope. Next is the Civil War in Words and Deeds, and this is the one that I can find being the most useful in genealogical research, especially providing that historical context, because these are first-person accounts um, that really chronicle the highs and lows of the Army life between 1861 and 1865. 
So these are uncovering the stories from these Civil War armies who we know were these, you know, often young, young, you know, high spirited, sentimental soldiers. These include, you know, their correspondence, their thoughts, their feelings, um, uncovering every aspect of the war, really. So these histories and personal narratives are one of the most useful sources um, regarding the Civil War and the Civil War's history, and they're really useful to genealogists. The last one is the War of 1812 Diplomacy on the High Seas, and this just covers, um, again, that War of 1812 correspondence. Um, these are commissions of uh, the letters of mark and reprisal to private armed vessels, permitting them to cruise against the enemies of the United States. So you can see the collection comprises these following files. Um, I've bolded the ones that I thought would be the most um, useful for your genealogy, um, some different letters, um, prisoners of war records, passenger lists of vessels, um, and letters about the release of prisoners. So we do not have a ton of time left, so I want to jump into the Civil War resource because I think that will probably be the most useful for your research. And all of these archives I'm bound databases work the same. So once you're familiar with the tools in one, you'll be able to jump into the other ones, no problem. You'll see here your Archives Unbound are actually um, divided um, into these categories, and you can access all of them here. So I am going to go into the Civil War in Words and Deeds. Just like with um, the slavery and anti-slavery archive, you'll see here, it looks the exact same. We have our overview here, our collection facts on the side. And like I said, this is the, this works the same, has the same tools as the, um, the other archive. The focus is just much more narrow. Here, we're just focusing on the Civil War. So I can choose to view all documents here. And you'll see here, it automatically pulls up these 487 different monographs. Again, this is a much, much smaller archive than slavery and anti-slavery, still a lot, um, but now we're down to 487. And there are different ways that you can filter within the, these results. So you can filter, for example, by the author. So if I'm looking for something composed by a particular person, I can find that over here on the side. Um, I can do the source library, publication date, and I can choose to search within as well. So if I wanted to do a search within result, for example, if I was looking, you know, if I wanna see some historical context, what it was like to be a prisoner of war during the Civil War, for example, I could do a search within. It's, it's going to be searching all of these monographs for the term prisoner. So here I've just, just narrowed it down just a little bit. So this is a great time to use some of these other filtering results here. Now I'm going to jump into the topic finder, for example. So I'm doing this search on the Civil War. I have done a search within tool for prisoners. And now I'm looking at this visual representation here. You can see the search terms that I've applied. I'm gonna go into regiment. And then I could break it down here. So if I wanted to look at the regiment for Indiana, for example, I could apply that. And I went from those 487 results now down to two. So if I wanted to look at um, for example, the 36th Regiment, Indiana Volunteer Infantry. So maybe um, a, a member of your family, of your ancestry, you know, was a member of this regiment, for example, and you wanted to know what life was like um, in the Civil War, you know, during that time for this group of men, then you could go here and scroll through this manuscript. You can scroll through just like the other in the other resource. All of the same tools and features exist. That OCR text is gonna be a little bit better here 
you see here we have a confidence rating of 91% now because we're just scanning in that text. There's no weird formatting or lists or anything like that. This can be copied and pasted. You have all of the same options to cite and send and download and get your link. We have here some related subjects to this. And then you can search within this document as well. Now I'm going to skip ahead to page 54, for example. Take away this OCR text. And you can see here that on page 54, I am given a list of names and some information about that people. Fortunately, here, like here, we have a member of this um, regiment that was killed at the Stone River and the date that that occurred. So you can see how this would maybe be used a little bit more, I guess, for traditional genealogical research here to find different records from different infantries and different groups. You can zoom in and zoom out. All of those same tools here, you can search within. And there are, like I said, this is the premier kind of resource, resource for, you know, researching the Civil War and all of the different, you know, things that come along with that from diaries and letters. I jumped out of that. So I did that by viewing all the documents and applying those filters and kind of searching down even to the state and the regiment that I was looking for. Um, but you can also search within this collection, kind of that basic search term. So if I wanted to search for a letter, for example, you'll see here a diary of events, one year in the Civil War, life in Southern prisons, letters from a surgeon of the Civil War. So really, really interesting archive documents here. That again, open up, you can search throughout, find different information that you're looking for. And you can search within the documents and see the search term hits below. Here I've searched for the word letter. So it's gonna pull up each time that has been mentioned. Here's one from Camp Wallace near Covington, Kentucky, right across the river from Cincinnati. A letter from, um, a letter from this soldier to his father. Now, another way that you could do this search is to search for a different battle, for example. So if I was looking for information from the Battle of Bull Run, I could look, I could do a search for Bull Run. Here I have a narrative of the campaign of the 1st Rhode Island Regiment, for example. Here we have portrait, some information about the campaign and the regiment. And then we're getting into those search terms that I've searched for. So like on this page, page 30, for example, we would learn more about camp life and what it was like um, at the, the camp for this bull run um, battle for this regiment. So this is a database that I could really find myself just um, spending a lot of time exploring because there is so much content housed here. Now I do wanna jump real quickly, I think we have enough time, Kate stop me if I'm wrong, um, to show you your other two documents here. You have, um, let me go to the Board of Foreign Missions. So your, your um, archives are divided into these four categories and we're gonna to go to Religious Studies. This is the archive that just has that correspondence from the Board of Foreign Missions and these are so interesting because these are, you know, just the incoming and outcoming um, correspondence. And there's so much to search through in these, in these 93 manuscripts. I mean, you have all the different filtering options and things here to the side as you do in the other databases, but these are set up just a little bit different. So I'm gonna hop here into, I was looking at one for 
Corsico earlier. 13, here we go. So if you saw um, game, kind of a section of correspondence that you were interested in, you'll see this one alone is 484 pages long. And you kind of get these kind of blurbs about the letters that are sent here on the main page. You can jump ahead to different pages. So for example, here I've went to um, jumped ahead to page six. Here's a, an interesting one that jumped out to me earlier. Um, this is talking about one of the missionaries that has traveled here to kind of spread this Presbyterian gospel. And you're seeing that he has been sent alone with his wife and his child out into the field to do these missionary work. And he's kind of saying, you know, would this be the same if I were a white missionary? Um, you know, this is only happening because of, um, you know, my race that I'm being sent out here alone in the field to do this work. This wouldn't happen to a white missionary in this instance. Um, something that jumped out to me and you can do a search so you know that stood out to me so i chose to do a search for black within this document and you'll see here i have a search term hit on page six where i read that originally i jump out to page eight and you'll see here that the black the black missionaries were not invited um, to eat with the white missionaries at their tables. Um, and this is talking about someone who nearly starved a missionary that was out there working um, because they were not invited to the same dinner table as him. I also did a search for um, women. And there was something here about um, a man wanted his wife to be paid for her services in the school. Um, and there was a big lengthy argument about um, white women being paid for their work in these missionary camps. So some really interesting things that you can search through. You'll notice that when I did these searches, they really only went up to about page 20. And that is because after um, a certain page, these become like handwritten documents. And we can't really search um, on that handwritten. So here is a page that I found interesting. This is a list of almost like a teacher report card type thing, um, a list of their student names in these missionary schools, their age, how they performed on fractions, ranked how they did in the class, um, there are also five spelling classes, one alphabet class. This would be a good time to use that zoom in tool so you can read some of this handwriting. So that's another example here um, in the Archives Unbound for the Board of Foreign Missions. You also have the War of 1812 Diplomacy on the High Seas. Again, it functions the exact same way, but there's some different document types in that. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but if you would like some information on that, please reach out to me. I do want to leave you today with some some support site information. Here at Gale, we have a pretty vast support site with a lot of um, different tools made available to you. Uh, we have an upcoming webinar on April 27th, actually, about what is um, new in Gale Primary Sources, some new, some new tools and things that we've added. So if you enjoyed this today and you want to learn more, I encourage you to check that out by viewing support.gale.com. We have a lot of different product info, um, a training center, and some marketing materials for you to, um, to use and aid in your research. And I will leave this up um, here for you. My name is Hannah Radbush again, and this is my contact information. I encourage you to reach out if you have, you know, any successes using this database. I would love to hear about them. Um, also, some contact information for your customer success manager, a training session survey if you don't care to fill that out. But um, that is all I have for you. Kate, I would love to hang on and answer some questions from the Q&A. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so we do have some questions for you. And the first one um, is someone is wondering how they can learn which local libraries in Massachusetts have subscriptions to these Gale databases. 
Uh, Marion, that is a great question and something that I can definitely look into for you. Um, I will get your name from Kate after this, your email, if that's okay. Um, and I can research that for you, Marion, and get back to you about what libraries around you have access to Gale. That's good. Thank you. Um, and then also related to access, um, someone else is wondering if Gale primary sources can be utilized outside of a library. Um, and Kate, this may be more of a question for you in terms of how your access is set up. This should be able, if you're a library member, correct me if I'm wrong, you should be able to access through your genealogy center website, right? Right. Okay, so as long as you're a member of the Allen County Public Library, you should be able to log in through your genealogy center. And that's where I was logging on um, today, if I can exile this PowerPoint, um, here under your genealogy center, the on-site databases, this is where you can access all of these. And when you click, you'll be um, prompted to enter your login credentials. So um, we have a couple of additional questions about um, does one have to come to the library to access these databases and can you access Gale offsite with an ACPL library card? So um, to use the Gale databases, you do have to be on site here at the Genealogy Center so you can access them um, with our computers or um, with your own device on our Wi-Fi. Um, so so they're not able to be accessed remotely with a library card, but you can you can access them here here on site. Um, and let's see, someone else asks, is this a paid subscription from home or just exclusive to libraries? Um, this is pretty much sold per, um, especially to libraries and some academic institutions have access as well through like collegiate libraries, acad um, universities. Okay, I think that is all. Um, so in the chat, I'll put our um, email address. It's genealogy at acpl.info. So um, feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions after the program today, or if you would like a copy of the chat from today's um, Zoom. So thank you again, Hannah. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. I hope you, everyone has a great rest of the day. Thank Thanks, you so much. You too. Bye-bye.